remote storage and remote access to any of the content they had, even after the fact. So this is your Camtasia debut. So if I screw up, it's going to be on there forever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I can even dub in cuss words and all kinds of stuff and say. Yes. Is that cool? <laughs> You're on. So I can laugh at that for the rest of the year. Hmm? All right. So just a quick question. How many guys have even heard of cloud storage or know of it? How many of you use it? The rest of you don't bow your head in shame, that's for it. All right, so as Stephen was saying, these are going to become extinct. These little, nice little thumb drives, you know, they were cool for a while, but it makes so much more sense just to have all of your information, all of your content go wherever you go without having to drag it with you. Um, back when I started, we had big old huge hard drives and I kept everything on that. It was a nice thing because I always had it with me, so I was really good about stuff like that. That thing is, if it fails, I, was, I lost all my work from previous years, the, you know, the current year that I was working on, everything would be gone. So that's something that you have to think about. Now, with using this on the, on the cloud storage, you don't have to worry about losing your information unless something incredibly catastrophic happens like it did during the summer but now they have more backup systems to keep something like that from not happening again so what I'm going to show you guys here is just a couple of things a couple of different cloud storages so the first one So the first one we have here is Dropbox. Now Dropbox is kind of nice. It is free. Um, the cool thing about Dropbox is um, I would probably say that you can always upgrade it to get more storage out of it. Um, like what Stephen was saying, Russell does use his quite extensively. He pays about $100 a year to get all this storage capacity for what he wants. To me, that $100 a year, that's, that's a bit much for me. So I'm kind of cheap and I like to go for the free stuff. So <laughs> when, you, um, when you sign up, it's as simple as entering your first, last name, an email address that you use, and create a password. One thing I want to go over with all of the cloud storages is you're going to want to always read the terms of service. Um, because there's things in there that you may not notice right away, but if you just click agree and don't read it, you know, it may be something that you might have a problem with later on. Um, Russell's a very good example. He does not like Google Drive because inside their agreement, they have the right to look into anything that you have in your content, whether you know it or not. He doesn't like that because he produces books, he's a writer and everything else. And so some of that stuff he doesn't want people peeking in on. So it makes sense that you know he wants to keep stuff like that private. So um, he likes going with uh, Dropbox because they can't look inside of it. The only downside to this is if you forget your password, you're kind of screwed on that dude because they don't have access to it and you won't have access to it. So you have to make sure that you pick a password that you'll remember or at least put it in a place that you can find it if you ever do forget it. But the nice thing about uh, Dropbox is once you sign up for it, they give you, uh, what is it? I think it's like 250 megabyte? No. How much? It's under a gig. Yeah, it's under a gig, something like that. I, I can't remember what it was, but it's, it starts out small. But there is a good thing about this. If you have a friend or person next to you, you sign them up you send them a, a friend request for it, right? If they sign up into Dropbox, then they automatically give you another 250 megabytes. So each person you keep adding, you can actually 
build up your Dropbox to have it become really big. Now, if you're like me, who has about 10 different emails for various different reasons, you could just do it to yourself 10 times, and before you know it, you got four gigs. So that's a quick and easy way how to do it. I didn't know that one. Yeah. yeah. If you don't have 10 emails, you can always make up 10 emails for yourself. <laughs> just pick the same password, I'd say. But anyways. But these are, you know, that's a that's an easy way to bump it up, you know. And I don't, the nice thing about Dropbox is that we use Dropbox with um, on the dome because there's a lot of people that send us projects from Germany and stuff like that. Well, it costs a lot of money to ship a little hard drive, you know. This isn't going to cut it, so they have to actually send an actual hard drive in the mail, and you know that's like a good seventy dollars right there just to ship it, you know, because of the weight of it. So if we use Dropbox, that makes it a little bit easier because all they have to do is just share the folder and then we can pull the content from there. And this may be like a 30 minute show, an hour long show or something like that. And of course we're using a 200, 200K resolution for the dome. That's a really huge file. So some of them may be 70, 80 gigs just alone for one project. So that's a massive project to be trying to deal with but if we do it online on Dropbox it may take an hour or so to download it but it's a lot easier than having to ship anything especially if you're a poor artist like most of us are so that's kind of the fun thing about Dropbox that's what makes that one pretty good um, oops let's see here So, as you guys know, we switched our email and everything. So, if you actually go to your email, there is also a cloud storage in that one as well. So inside your very own email, you have the SkyDrive right up here. This thing was staring me in the face for the longest time and I didn't even know it. So all you have to do is just click on it. And as you can see, I already kind of started a couple of, um, couple of folders in here. You may not have as cool a picture as I do in yours, but that's okay. You just work with what you got, okay? So don't feel bad. So what I can do with this is, what I've been told is, I asked Anthony how big the storage is for this. He said about 25 gigs. So I don't know exactly why he says about, but it either is or it isn't. But So you have roughly about 25 gigs to deal with. That should be more than enough to do whatever you guys need to do in here, whether it's very large format imaging, uh, long documents, anything like that. All of that, you have more than enough space to deal with. The only ones that I think may not, it may not be enough for is um, a few student, the students that are actually in the moving images or anything like that, you're definitely gonna need a lot more than that. But if you were saving like your final projects to it, you know, in a MP4 format, a compressed format, then, you know, that may be enough just to hold just whatever you had created, you know, the final piece or whatever. Even if you guys have videos or something, um, documentaries or interviews, things like that that you need to keep for your particular content, this would be a good way to keep it for you while you're at school and everything. Um, and if you like SkyDrive, if you like the way it works, you can always sign up for it outside and and get it in your at home on your home computers or whatever. It's it's really simple to create anything in here. All you have to do is click on the file and look, you can create a new document, you can upload documents, new folders, edit documents. That's the other cool thing about this 
is that if you're doing your homework, like let's say you're doing a, a research paper or something, you can actually do it in your cloud storage. Because this has Word, it has um, Excel, it has PowerPoint, and yeah, that's pretty much all you need for that. So you could do pretty much any of those in your cloud storage. And it's all right there, so it goes wherever you go, pretty much. As long as you have access to a computer and the internet, you're good. And your IAI email account has to be active. Because once you graduate, I think if your account active, six months and then it's shut down. So we want to make sure that if you have anything here, you're not going to be here if you graduate, you find some way to move it to another site or a skydive. Sorry to butt in. Oh, no, no. no. That's important. No, that's a good point, yeah. Once you, once you graduate <laughs> here, you, know, you, you cease to exist. So before you go out and party when you graduate, make sure you take all your content first. <laughs> in case you forget, then you go, yeah, don't want to do that. So, you know, we can easily just create new folders. It does take a little while sometimes. So let's say working on it, and you'll be sitting there for about 30 seconds, you're like, come on. And it'll pop up eventually. But you can name, um, you can just create any new folder that you want. And then, of course, you can always upload content to it as well. Um, And like I said, you can also see if this will work for me. So if you are using a thumb drive or a hard drive or something like that, and there's stuff that you definitely want to back up, whatever you have on your thumb drives, because those things can crash at any time. You could go home and be doing your laundry, and then before you know it, it's in the dryer with all your stuff tumbling around in there and you don't know whether or not it's going to keep or die out on you. So what you could do is, um, so I have my little thumb drive right here. So I can grab a document. And then I could just select it from your choose file, hit OK and then it adds the document in there. It'll take a couple seconds to repopulate, but then you'll see your assignments start popping up. The other thing you can also do is, like I said, it can take video, it can take Excel files. So if you created any kind of documents in Word, Excel, PowerPoint, this will recognize it, no problem. And you can also go into it and you can edit it further if you need to as well. So even if you're, let's say you have to do a presentation for somebody or something like that, you can have everything right here. And say you had a video or something and you wanted to upload all of that in there, you could. And then all you have to do is just be able to access your email and then you'll be able to, let's see if this will work. So you can have your whole presentation right here if you needed to. How do you make a new account? How do you make a new account? Uh, you would just go to um, office365.com and then you would subscribe to creating a new account. That will probably cost you. That will cost you. That's a good question. Uh, I think it's uh, 79 or something like that. So if you actually read any emails from Don, you should be able to find them. If you just deleted it, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing I'll show you guys here is you also have one in your blackboard. What is that? Oh god, what's this? Is it IAIA? IAIA online. Yeah, that one expires right at the end of the semester. Although we have a copy of it in our class. 
but they only keep that for a limited amount of time. So, so. Okay, so in in your Blackboard, you actually have your content collection right here. And it's pretty much the same as all the other uh, cloud services. You can simply just upload anything you want. Just click on here, upload files, choose a file. Uh, click on submit. And it will upload your, your files. Now the cool thing about the Blackboard is it's unlimited. So you have as much memory and gigs as you want, which is really awesome. So if you got a lot of huge file projects or anything like that, this I, I would definitely recommend using the Blackboard to upload all of your stuff onto it. Um, if you're if 25 gigs is about what you need, then I would definitely use the SkyDrive because that's right there in your email, so it's always there. But of course, your blackmail is always there as well. But that's the one definite plus about the Blackboard is that you are not limited by any means on how much information you can put in your in your storage. Just remember, if you will, when you graduate, you want to get that out of there, but make sure you have some place to put it that has uh, as much as you need. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes. On the uh, Blackboard for IDI and content collection, um, it says it can be shared with everyone in the Yes. Yeah, it would just be the same as, you know, handing a, a paper or sending an email saying like, hey, can you look this over and tell me if I at least spelled my name right, you know. That's, that's exactly what it's for. You know, you can share it with whoever you want um, or whoever you don't want. It's entirely up to you. And all of them have that same uh, feature in it. The SkyDrive does, Dropbox does, you can share uh, folders with each other, all of that. Anybody else have any questions, concerns? All right. If you do have any questions or anything, usually in my office. If not, you can always email me or call me or send a postcard. Yes? How do you sync it to a folder? Yes, you. Um, if you go to the um, Sky uh, if you go to SkyDrive, you can actually download it onto your computer if you have your own personal computer, and then you can create a folder in that, and then whatever you drag into it, it will automatically share and upload and keep it synced up. Mm -hmm. It's the same with Dropbox too. Yeah, I have Dropbox. If if. If you guys have um, some of the newer smartphones, pretty much all of them have that feature in it. So the other thing about that is just be careful what you take pictures of because it will get uploaded to your job box. <laughs> and then before you know it, you're like, I thought I deleted that picture of me drinking. And it's in your <laughs> drop box. So yeah, exactly. You know, something embarrassing, hanging off the roof naked, drinking, something like that. Yeah. It's in the settings. Let's see here. Uh, where is it? Uh, where is it? Uh, 
think of where it was. It's under site settings. Let's see here. Oh man, I can't remember where it is now. I will have to look for that again. I, I just had it, now I can't remember where it was. Clicking on too many boxes is my problem. But, yeah. But, you can download it and sync it up. So. I just can't remember what it is off the top of my head. <coughs> yeah. Too many cloud stores. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions? Now that you know about it, who's going to use it. All right, a couple more. Good. Good. Always remember when you're using cloud storage. Sign out. Public computer like IIA. Sign out afterwards. And that includes in here. Not only to sign out, but to clear your browser history. And if you're using Chrome, for example, it'll give you the option to clear everything you browse for the last hour, the last day, the last week, or from the beginning of time. Always choose from the beginning of time. All right, always choose on a public computer to delete your entire history or to clear that from your browser. Because if you don't, and I come across that computer and I find some embarrassing pictures, it's going on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot too long. And I'm embarrassed to say this, but I think it's important to know that your instructors are mortal. And things sometimes happen because I uh, had created your quiz on visual photography and digital audio, and I created it in an Excel spreadsheet to upload to Blackboard and inadvertently delete the file before I had a chance to upload it and I didn't have it backed up. So I've got to reconstruct the whole quiz so the quiz will not be until the end of class on Wednesday. I know that disappoints you greatly. <laughs> I, I, can please, I, I can please accept my most humble apologies uh, for that oversight and mistake. Robert was here, wasn't he? Or was I hallucinating? No, he was here. He was here. Okay, we well, just stepped out for the rest of the room tomorrow. I mean, 
So for today, I'm going to be discussing the uh, curator statement. And it's going to be a curator statement that is different when it's spoken aloud as compared to one that is done in print. Because when we're speaking aloud, we want to make sure that we're conversational. So we'll be doing a little bit about uh, writing a curator statement and then how do we record that. And then we'll be working more in design in your mind. Because the curator statement that you are going to be composing is going to be in the first part of this catalog that you're designing. So you will be uh, either recording it directly into the garage band or recording it with a digital um, recorder. I strongly suggest using a digital recorder and we can sign them out from the set um, over in the media room because you want to record in a room that has slightly less noise than this one. Because what do you hear when I, when I silence my voice? You hear an echo? Whatever that is, I don't know if it's the plumbing or the heating or what, but it's something that uh, creates a constant white noise in the background. Now, if you were in a course directly related to audio production, you would learn actually how to be able to remove that noise from your recording. It would actually find the frequencies in which that is vibrating in audio. You can actually go in and you can cut that sound right out. It's really eerie uh, what you can do with audio production now. We're not going to go to that level. So what you have to do is find a setting that has a little bit more friendly ambient sound if uh, you're going to be in a it has uh, sound in it, or you can actually reserve to have the sound recording booth over uh, next to the library uh, to record, where you have a completely uh, closed off uh, setting. So a curator statement. I mentioned how the first part of your catalog will have a curator statement, which is going to place this catalog in your design into a larger perspective. And then you'll have an exhibit that you'll be curating, and it's going to be a much more narrow perspective. Right, so we're going to think of it as being somewhat, this design as being almost a two-funnel approach. All right, and being very general, being very specific, and then general about the student exhibit, and then very specific items and models. So this is getting used to be writing, actually it's going to be two curator statements. And this is going to place your project in what we'll call larger context at the Institute of American Indian Arts. So a curator statement is actually an amazing opportunity to be able to guide the way the public or not, in general or people in particular perceive your exhibition. It gives you a chance to communicate directly with viewers and help them understand your point of view. And ideally to get people excited and curious enough to, uh, to think about and to come and view the work they're going to or the exhibit they're about to experience. This is a typo, there should be an E on the end. And if you think of this in your own professional career, this is an opportunity when you are applying for a job as a curator to show you've been there, done that. Not only in print, but in the voice. And this is something really important to think about in the 21st century. In the same way, I encourage artists, yes, it's good to show in the gallery. And to remember when you show in the gallery and you're angry about the cut that the gallery owner is cutting, or is making for your work being there, remember, you're not the one who's paying for the storage space. You're not the one who's paying the insurance. You're not paying the utilities. You're not paying for the wall space on which that piece is residing. You're not paying for the parking. You're not paying for the utilities. But actually, that curator is putting as much into your work, or that owner is putting as much into your work as you are financially. So you know, when, when, when that gallery is saying you're going to get a 60%, I'm taking a 40% commission. Remember, 
It's not just 40% off the fluff. That person, and particularly if they are on the plaza, the rent for a closet on the plaza is as much as a home mortgage would be here. It's astoundingly expensive. So just be aware as an artist and in curator. So something you can do to empower yourself is to become digital. And if you're an artist, to be able to show your work online. To be able to put uh, your prints, your sculpture, your paintings, your photographs online. Have your own website, your own blog. What's really important too is be able to speak intelligently about what you have done. If possible, and remember that it's really important when you are trying to sell your work as well as to sell an idea to advance your career, where you can speak intelligently and someone can actually hear your voice, even if it's online, you are that much more real to that prospective employer or buyer. And that's why it's important to be able to speak intelligently, conversationally and not alienate the general audience that you are speaking to, even if it's just a computer. Something I found, for example, teaching online, that in some of my classes where there is uh, a lot of bandwidth available, I actually will use video of me speaking too. So you'll, you'll actually see not only PowerPoint, but you'll actually see a little fan up in the corner. And it's astounding how much that creates an intimacy. Even if it's virtual, the person knows what you look like, they see your facial expression, they know what you sound like, they recognize you. It adds an extra element of familiarity and approachability. It's really important. And being able to speak intelligently, instead of saying, oh, I just had a bunch of bees kicking around, and so I thought I'd make this crayon. <laughs> Intimacy. Intimacy. So paragraph one, I'm sorry, in general, your curator statement should be about 200 to 300 words in length. About three paragraphs. You want to have a professional and conversational tone all at once that you're going to be informative and persuasive at the same time. When you are speaking or writing to inform, you are, in essence, making the world larger for the person who's reading or hearing. You're educating them. Ideally, in the term that I use in other classes, I call it edutainment. You educate and entertain at the same time. Who says learning has to be awful? So, I know even teaching public speaking or watching public speakers, if someone stands up and says, well, I'm going to bore you for the next 10 minutes, I am one of the audience who will yell out, will shut up and sit down with Don't waste my time. Inform and entertain. In other words, this should be fun. It should be interesting. It can be fun. It can be interesting. A strategy in that can be making the familiar unfamiliar. Showing the audience or the readers how something they see all around them, show them a new way to look at it. Or it could be something making the unfamiliar familiar, which means it's something they have never encountered before, but show how it is like something they have already experienced, heard, or done, or said. So making the familiar strange or the strange familiar. All of this is done to promote interest, promote interest. And you want to avoid as much as possible the art world jargon that could alienate a generalized audience. All right, so if you're going to use the term postmodern, I'm going to put your stuff right down. Save that for the critics. 
In general, most people were going to walk down these halls and come through our uh, primitive edge uh, openings you know, from the general public. They're not here to hear about coastline. That man, most of them are not here to, to talk about post Indian or post apocalyptic. What's that? <laughs> That's the worst. That's the worst, yeah. Especially if you're living in it. <laughs> Which we are. As tribal peoples, we are. We have survived our own Holocaust. We're standing in the ashes of a house that burned down. So when we think about this, we want to make sure that whatever we're doing isn't going to alienate the general audience. Now, one of the things that I'm going to be very explicit in our situation. In the art world, most of the people who are reading and buying your work as an artist or your work as a curator are going to be non native. I don't know that many Indians who can collect art. to be attention getting. You want it to provoke curiosity and you want to avoid being too obvious. In other words, you want your title to be about the exhibit without actually uh, revealing exactly what's in it. And this is where it can be hard to avoid the jargon. Now, if you all watch game shows where what's behind door number three? And you're watching it, you're really wondering, what's behind door number three? It's just door number three, but you're waiting. All right, that's the kind of anticipation that you ideally that you would have a viewer or reader to have. The title that you're using relates to the overall theme, but doesn't necessarily disclose it or reveal it. So everyone's title is going to be different. Paragraph one, an attention-based statement. What is it that you could say? You want to make sure that that statement um, isn't going to be like throwing firecrackers into a trash can and having people just startled and scared. You want it to relate to the overall theme, but it is that statement that you could say or write that grabs the reader by the eyeballs or by the ear and says, pay attention to this, this is important. And it doesn't have to be outrageous, it can be just thought provoking. It could be a question, it could be a statement. You want to establish within this first paragraph the overall premise of the art of the exhibit. A premise is a reason. We might say your exhibit is an argument. Now, an argument, in essence, is a conclusion that's supported by evidence. So there is some conclusion, there is some reason as well that you have developed this exhibit. So why is this important? Why is it relevant? What needs are being addressed with the artists as well as the media that they are utilizing to approach this uh, 
this exhibit. What led to the development? What is it that was part of your thought process? This is a part where you may be saying something that makes the familiar strange or the strange familiar. So if we're looking at about 300 words of a curated statement, you're, thinking, you're looking here anywhere from 75 to 100 words if you're carved up. And what this causes you to do is you have to be brief, you have to be succinct, you have to be concise. The second paragraph, you've got a brief critical analysis of the words. Now, critical does not necessarily mean that you are critiquing the word. Obviously, you critique it because it wouldn't be in the exhibit if you didn't. That's already been done. You've already selected. You've already chosen. You don't need to critique it in that manner. In this case, what you are doing is you are illustrating how the work and the examples that the artists have produced relates to this overall theme. So as part of this, because I remember I told you, I think it was to shoot five objects out there. Oh, did I just do something? Give me a second here. Here. So how do each of the artists fit into the theme? So since you've only got five objects as this first part of this catalog, you name them by name. You name the subject matter out loud, the medium that has been utilized as well as the methods or techniques that you think are significant. Now, in this case, I'm going to decide the theme for you. So we'll take some of that more out of it. And the theme, and you interpret it as you like. The theme is going to be giving back. What's the theme? Now, most of the work out there is going to be sculpture. Unless you chose something inside the building or the mural from the Northwest Coast on the side, most of it's going to be sculpture. But the media may differ because it could be bronze, it could be patinated bronze. Could be wood. And also, if there is a particular work that was instrumental in the way you think about this exhibition, it could be described, you could describe that work in more depth to draw the viewer into your thought process. So out of those five objects, out of those five pieces, which one stands out to you is most illustrative of that theme giving back? You're not saying that this one is more important. For that matter, you don't say, I think this is the best one, and this is mine. You leave that part of the decision to the what this is going to do, though, is that in a digital format, anyone around the world can see just this first part of your catalog. Not only with the feed, hear your voice, but you provoke interest, not only in that artist or artists, but you provoke interest for the institution in whom you work. I promise you, in the museum world, the more that you can do as a curator to draw critical attention to your institution, greater chance that you have not only of being hired, the greater chance you have in promoting other types of exhibits. And for that matter, if you want to become one of those wine-drinking, salmon, potato, cheese, 
swallowing kind of curators that talks a lot but doesn't do much to socially conscious. You become one of those darling curators and send you around the world. Curate, be an ale. And in paragraph three, what does this scene suggest to the larger world? How does what you are doing in this place, that these artists have done with this theme, how does this apply to the broader perspective, the broader world? How does this relate to someone who's in Botswana? How does this relate to someone who's in Venice? How does this relate to someone who's in Moscow? For that matter, to larger social, cultural, economic issues. And you want to be sure, in many ways, this is going to be the most persuasive part of your statement. Because it is in this part right here that the person who's sitting on the other side of the screen decides to take ownership or not of the ideas. Have you presented an effective argument? Have you shown representative examples? Talked about them in an authoritative, yet conversational way that causes them to say, wow, I never thought of that. I want to know more. I want to donate money to. I want to attend. I want to find out who this artist is. So as a curator, it's not only your voice that is being represented, it is the institution with whom you work. And there are curators, uh, I tend to call them mercenary curators or elements curators. Where, and you make good money for this, by the way. You can work four weeks out of a year, essentially. And spend every three months in a different city telling people what to do for a week. And the rest of it is them going to show up and you showing up at the opening, rattling it off, and collecting your money for it. And there are curators who do this. <laughs> yeah, that's not a bad argument, by the way. I mean, that's what your motivation is. I mean, this, this I mean, I, I got to talk about business you know, and the whole spectrum. And I make no judgment on um, whether that is good or bad or not. What I judge is are you socially and culturally conscious? Because you can still be a socially conscious person here. What would drive me crazy, though, is if you come up and you want to exhibit and you're talking about the Say the, the amazing benefits of fried bread. And then you do the next exhibit and you're talking about type 2 diabetes. All right? To me, that's real contradictory. So be consistent in the standards you take. Don't just take any job and don't work for just any institution. And for that matter, as a curator, you are asked. Should you become one of those guest curators to work for an institution, look at an institution's history. What's that expression? If you lie down with dogs, you get up with leaves. You want to make sure that the institution that's hiring you has socially, culturally responsible positions that they have promoted socially, culturally, uh, we'll say, empathetic. Relevant. Awareness. And if I ever hear that you are working for a mobile corporation, I will take you down. If I ever hear you're working for a fracker, I will hunt you down. If I ever hear you're working for 
for Peabody Cole. I will hunt you down. Thank mm-hmm. you.